Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming to listen to me. Uh, tonight, I am going to talk about Tibet, and I would like to say there are still a few spaces available on the tour, which goes the end of June, July this year. Uh, the closing date is probably going to be the next two to three weeks, so if you are interested after seeing this presentation, please contact the AGS at Perth Show, note interest, and uh, we will take it from there. So I'm going to go back to the basics, why, type, why Tibet, and it all stems to my good friend Harry Anz, uh, way back in 2007, asked if I would like to help him organise a tour to Tibet, and obviously I jumped at the chance. And we contacted our local agent in uh, Yunnan asking could we organise a, or do a recce to see if it was feasible to, this point, drive from Chengdu to Lhasa. And uh, we managed to get all this sorted out. And the first part of my talk is going to be about the autumn reconnaissance trip. And then the last part is mainly about the tour we're going to do in June from Lijiang to Chengdu. Okay, so on the map here, you can see sort of Chengdu and then Lhasa away in the center of the map. It's roughly about 2,100 kilometers. And in the autumn time, we gave ourselves a very short time to go from Chengdu to Lhasa. It was about 12 days just to see if the trip would be feasible, the roads were okay, accommodation was okay, and what the high passes were like. So the first part is mainly about the gentians, but to get into Tibet, there are so many forms you have to fill out and get, travel group lists, um, all sorts of different uh, authorization. And then we were sent to the section for the aliens, and we had to get a... Uh, an alien travel permit to travel into Tibet. But once all that was in place, it was fairly plain sailing. So when we get to Chengdu, obviously we went to Wulong to sort of see the giant pandas. And the picture on the right hand side was taken many, many years ago when we were allowed to be able to touch the pandas and have them sit on your lap for, I think it was about 10 dollars or something in those days but uh, these days I think we're not allowed to do that anymore but it was really nice to sort of see the pandas in uh, Wulong itself and going in the autumn time it's totally different obviously things have uh, flowered and seeded and you can see here lots of drying of uh, walnuts and corn which they sort of love to have in their sort of uh, windows and houses and it's just a quite a nice and totally different feeling going in the autumn time. Our first place was after Chengdu was Kanding, which is at the base, and it's really quite a nice little uh, city. But the main point for going to Kanding is going up to uh, Jedu Pass. And this pass is, like you say, at 4,298 metres. Uh, very, very high. And... Uh, it is a really, really exciting area, lots of interesting plants, lots of endemic plants, and all the way through this talk, a lot of these plants only grow in certain passes, hence why we're doing uh, this tour. But in the autumn time, it's really nice to see some of the Saussurias. This is Saussuria stella, which has been in cultivation. It's a beautiful thing, monocarpic, grows here in really uh, wet areas, and it's like a, a, a starfish with these lovely uh, purple bracts coming out and then the flowers in the centre, a really lovely little thing. And also growing quite high up is the Delphinium bezianum, uh, quite a, a compact thing you see growing here in sort of really turfy conditions. And again, a lot of these plants are at high altitude, so dealing with dealing with extreme conditions. On the way from Chengdu to Lhasa, there was about three or four different passes. And I'd like to say this was way back in 2009. So a lot of things have changed uh, from 2009 to obviously uh, this year. And some of these passes, uh, you were able to sort of drive up and over. A lot now have tunnels going through, but the old roads going over the top are still passable with care. But Gersu Pass was really quite nice. You can see the mountain ranges in the back. 
and um, 4,400 metres, quite high up. And growing here is a uh, Gentiana tong tongalensis, growing in these sort of uh, shaly areas. Uh, a beautiful thing, lovely yellow flowers, compact, hardy, a really nice plant. Scissor Pass, I went to this place in uh, 2019. Uh, it was a wee bit difficult to get up, but in the foreground you can see a lot of these little blue flowers. And this is a uh, Gentiana viciorum. Viciorum likes to grow in sort of very dry areas. It never likes to be having its roots in sort of wet conditions. It always likes to be on the dry side. So here we can see viciorum, a lovely plant in cultivation, easy to grow. And I'd probably say one of the, the better ones to grow if you, if you can get hold of it. And a few more ones here, we have Gentiana sinuanata. There is so much variation in these uh, gentians. Uh, this was a nice one, looked a bit like the saltire. Uh, we were just looking at plants, we weren't collecting, so, but I do have uh, coordinates. Featurum again, and then Gentiana sechuanica or Georgia, which has this uh, distinctive cross of leaves and this white large flower poking up from the, the center. Lots of other gentians, Gentiana stipitata, lovely thing where the sort of petals are slightly reflexed back the way. And again, this likes to grow in sort of fairly dryish conditions. And a lot of this stuff is all just roadside botany. So we're not exploring or walking miles and miles and miles. This is just sort of driving along, getting out the car, walking up the hill slightly and seeing what's there. So it is quite easy to, to get to these plants. And this was, like say, in 2009, this was us entering into Tibet. Things are a bit different now. There's lots of new roads being uh, made. They were starting doing it in 2009, and a lot of these now have finished. So um, a bit more different entering into Tibet now. But this is this was the entry point uh, way back in 2009. And now we're coming into Tibet and Dungala was spectacular in the autumn time and it's even more spectacular in the sort of spring summer time 5200 uh really really high but you can see here these beautiful screes coming down and you don't think there's much growing in these areas but once you get your eye and start wandering about you will see lots of interesting plants again in the autumn time here we have a wee delphinium chrysostricum growing in this very, very loose scree. And what I would say is it is quite difficult walking in, uh, well, certainly at altitude, but also in these scree conditions, you end up doing three steps forward and about five back, trying to get your, your foothold all the way up, but uh, well worth it. And this beautiful little uh, delphidium. Raoul Lake, um, again, dropping down slightly. You can see here in the autumn time, beautiful conditions, hopefully, in June, July time, the weather should be really good as well. But in the autumn time, obviously we're getting the autumn color and you can sort of see here, all the, the rowans and uh, poplars and all the rest of it just coming into full flower, but absolutely beautiful. And then the Demola, another very interesting area. You can see here, there's only certain times you can get to this bit. This is all the, the snow melt from the glacier, so in the morning it's okay to go, but by late afternoon it's really difficult to try and get the vehicle out, so you have to sort of time a lot of these uh, trips first thing in the morning before all the ice starts melting. But this is the type locality for Saks Ludlowii, and we would be spent ages in 2009 trying to find this. We just about gave up, and then the last little side valley we managed to find uh, this plant growing and not a very good picture, but this is this purple flower. Hadn't been seen for many, many years, 30, 40 years, and, but now it's back in uh, cultivation, which is nice. Other plants, you'll see this sort of flower sort of uh, summer all the way through, a Juga lupulina, absolutely beautiful uh, plant, about 30 centimetres tall, well worthy of being able to, to grow in gardens. Uh, and this colonizes on sort of the, the plateaus. Bomi is one of the 
nicest towns, uh, and this area here is really spectacular. Uh, we're spending quite a bit of time in uh, June round about this area because it is lots of interesting valleys and uh, new areas to explore as well. Also on the, the tour, we're not just looking at plants, we're also taking in cultures. Um, we do a few monasteries, which I'll show you a little bit uh, later on. But it's always nice to sort of take in the atmosphere, sort of speak to people, take photographs. They're all really friendly, lovely people. And here you can sort of see a mix of Tibetan and uh, Hun Chinese. But to me, on the autumn trip, the Galang La, and also on uh, the spring trip, spring summer trip, was like the pearly gates of heaven. This was hitting the jackpot. This was absolutely a magical area. You can see the glacier sort of coming down. And then we managed to sort of drive all the way through. You can see here just at the side, Crementhodium rhodocephalum, which tends to sort of run in amongst all the stones. Other interesting plants, Circeum aerophroides, quite a tall Circeum, about 70 centimetres tall, beautiful. And lots of Ed Sorsuria, this is Obvalata, uh, again about 30 centimetres tall with this sort of nice dome on the top. But uh, autumn time was good, but spring, summer time is exceptional. Also, once you get into Tibet, you'll be able to hopefully see Nanchi Barwa, which is the third highest mountain in the Himalayas at six, eight hundred metres. You can just see the sort of top of it poking out of the clouds here. So fingers crossed, once we get to that point, it'll be in uh, full view. And then the last couple of um, passes before we get to Lhasa is uh, Circumla 4-6. Uh, and again, you can just see autumn colour, new roads coming through here. Uh, lots of Cynanthus lobatus growing about, quite large uh, flowers. Also, uh, other lots of gentians, interesting plants. And here you can see Gentiana cynoronata. It's always nice to show the different variation. Here you can sort of see like different tube lengths. And then the next picture, you can see the different sort of size of flowers. So lots of variations uh, within uh, the sort of wild colonies. And then Gentiana obconica, one of the sort of last gentians that we saw on the, the autumn part of the trip. And now I'm going to focus on the main trip this year from Yunnan to Lhasa. This is going to be a superb trip. This was the route we went um, in 2009, coming from Chengdu from the top. We are now coming from the bottom, from Lijiang up through the Chin, and then on the same road all the way through. And then Lhasa is the way across to the left-hand side. So the first part's different, but the... The main part is the same. So Lijiang, we fly from we fly into Chengdu, then we go from Chengdu down to Lijiang. Lijiang is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and we were fortunate to see it before it changed quite a bit away back in the 90s. And over the last 25 years, it has changed quite a bit, but it still keeps the, the beauty of the, the little uh, town or village, the river comes through it, uh, the lovely hotels, and uh, it is a very nice place to sort of set the tour off, quite low down, about 2,300 or 2,000 metres. From there, we then go up into Gang Ho Ba, which is a really, really nice area. We've been here many times. This is a view just, uh, and again, late late spring, early summer. Uh, all this is uh, water flushing down from the glaciers and it leaves a silty deposit. Uh, it's like a, a valley which you go through and there's lots of endemic uh, species just growing in this area. I'm not going to show you all the plants we'll see because we'll be here for the, the next three weeks, but this is just some of the highlights that people will see uh, when, we, when we go to Tibet. Cypripediums, there are quite a lot. Flavum, this is a uh, flavum growing in the scrub. You can see here the juniper and quercus, and they form quite large clumps. There is Cypripedium lincoliangensis, which is very, very rare, but due to grazing and collecting by other people, 
This is extremely rare. We might see plants of that. I'll not put it in just to, I don't want to wet people's appetite too much, but uh, hopefully if we have a good look, we might find something, but it is extremely rare. The main reason we go to this part is for uh, the Roscoia. This is Roscoia humiana. And this is this part is well known for different forms of humiana colour wise. A really lovely plant, very small flowers at the start, but the after flowering it has these huge leaves. So you think it's quite a compact little plant, but it does take up a large space, so be wary. Also, we have Roscoia cotleoides. Uh, so this is the yellow one. You also get Schneideriana, which is a, a pinky purple one. Uh, and this just colonizes in amongst the sort of the pine forest. Uh, absolutely beautiful uh, little plant. And again, we have it growing in the garden and it does colonize quite a lot. I've been seeing this plant since 1994. This is Lilium bakery de la Vi. It always comes up through a certain uh, quercus at the entrance to Ganghoba Hoba at the top. Uh, obviously, it's quite difficult to dig up or to graze, so every year it comes up. But this is a plant to about 1.5 metres tall. Beautiful thing. Uh, you can see the sort of mottled uh, flower, sort of um, orangey with sort of like dots on it. Um, but uh, every year we go there we either see it just emerging or in full flower, so hopefully we'll be able to see that plant um, in June time. And like I say, this is like the glaciers coming down. Um, it's quite a flat area. I would say they do have uh, leeches here, so we do need to be a wee bit careful, um, but uh, the plants outweigh the leeches. And this is the type locality for uh, Mechanopsis de la Vea. Uh, it grows in just one little patch at the far end of the valley. There must be about maybe 20 or 30 plants. I've never seen it anywhere else just apart from this area here. Um, a lovely little thing and hopefully in China there's 40 to 50, even maybe 60 different species of uh, Mechanopsis. So we will see quite a large number, lots of monocarpic ones, but we will see some of the, the big blues and hopefully the yellow ones as well. This is uh, looking from Gang Ho Ba down towards, this is uh, Li Zhang away in the distance. Uh, many, many moons ago, this, you just used to be able to sort of drive up. Now it's like a national park. They have uh, chairlifts going up to some of the mountains. Uh, very, very popular. Uh, so it's very nice to sort of get up. We have to get permission to go off piste up into Gang Ho Ba. But once we get up there, there's no other people. Uh, it's just the, the group and it's a great place to be. From there, we go to Joseph Rock's house, um, who based himself in Li Zhang and spent years and years here and spoke the language and went collecting. And it's quite nice to see these houses uh, still preserved. And then after here, we start moving north. We're going to stop off at uh, Tiger, Tiger Leaping Gorge. And the, the myth is that a tiger jumped from one side onto the rock into the middle and across the other side. Uh, and it is quite a nice uh, feature to go and see and there are quite a lot of steps leading down to it but if you want to pay the people on the right hand side some money they will take you down and bring you back up again so uh, you don't have to exert yourself too much. We are now heading up towards, uh, I always call it Zongdien but now it's changed to Shangri-La. This is the Zongdien Plateau and it goes on forever and ever and it's just this flat plateau but some really interesting plants and endemic plants grow here as well. Here we can see Iris barbatula just growing. And what I would say is in, in China and Tibet, if you go to certain countries, you'll maybe find small groups of plants. But I found in sort of China, it's not small, it's like sways, you know, large clumps or hillsides covered in the same plant. So you're seeing them in sort of quantity and quality. But Iris barbatula, a nice little uh, iris. And then I think one of my favourite plants is this Thermopsis barbata, a member of the pea family. You can see here it has this lovely 
chocolate flower and this lovely light green hairy leaves. We have collected seeds, we've grown it back at Edinburgh, but it never ever stands upright, it always flops down. But it only tends to grow on the, the plateau near Shangri-La and an absolutely stunner of a plant. And you can see here growing in quite extreme conditions, the soil types very, very clay and uh, it just likes to sort of thrive in this little area in the uh, plateau. Another plant you'll see by the, the hundreds or the thousands is uh, Stellar Shami Jasmine Var Chrysantha. This is a, a great plant. It's always uh, yellow in Yunnan. If you go into Sichuan, it becomes white. The two never cross over. Uh, but these plants, I would say 30, 40, 50 years old, take a long time to get to establish themselves. They are available in the UK. We have grown them, but um, they tend to last about maybe three or four years and then sometimes uh, decide to vacate the, the bed. And also in the, um, the plateau, they have these beautiful uh, drying frames. So it's nice to sort of take in a little bit of the culture as well. I've never seen um, uh, material on these going back. I saw them way back in the, the 90s, but uh, these days they're just really there for uh, people to photograph. They're not really used, but uh, nice to see how they did it in the olden days. And then this plant was a new species described by Chris Gray Wilson from the ACE expedition. It uh, only grows, as you see, in uh, Zongdien, so Zongdienensis. Quite a tall incurvilia with uh, lots of flowers. Grows up to about, I would say, 50, 60 centimetres and just grows in this area. And there's lots of different um, types of uh, incurvillias, some very compact, which we'll see later on. And some of the some of them are quite tall, up to about a meter tall, but uh, we will see lots of incurvillias on the, the, the trip. We did mention about seeing a few monasteries, and this is the Shongzam Monastery. Um, <clears throat> I think it's well worth a visit uh, just to sort of see all the paintings and the gold leaf. It's it's quite spectacular. It can get quite busy, but if you go first thing in the morning, uh, we will hopefully avoid all the crowds but uh, and get the nice blue sky behind it. But uh, it's nice to see uh, all the, the woodwork, the paintings, and you can wander about to your heart's content. And there's no one uh, giving you, saying you can't enter these areas. So quite nice to be. And then a new bit we're going to go to is Hongshan. I, I love this area. There's it's such a rich diversity of plants. Um, we are a little bit higher, 4,000. Uh, we are using jeeps to get to this area, but you cover all aspects. You come up through the spectrum of the, the forest up into the high alpines and then dipping down back into the forest. If you get a chance, I want to go over the far side and see some of the megacodons and the big swathes of primulas, but... Uh, I just love this place. There is a tunnel going through it. This is the old road, hence why we need to use jeeps for uh, certain parts of the, the tour. But we'll see, or hopefully see, Fritillaria della Vei. This loves to grow in scree conditions. Uh, it's adapted very well. If it's not in flower, it is very difficult to see the plant. Um, I know two locations where it does grow, so um, we've been very fortunate to see it the last couple of times I've been there, so fingers crossed it's still there. A lot of these plants the Chinese use for medicinal purposes, so we do, hopefully uh, they will leave these ones uh, for, the, for nature. You can't go to China without mentioning Corydalis. Um, Again, a, a species which just gives me full of, or get, makes me so excited. This is Corydalis benesincta. And without the flowers, it would be very hard to sort of try and spot the leaves. They are quite similar to the sort of grey slate that you see in front of you. So, same with the frontal area, it can adapt itself to its surroundings. So, it's quite difficult to see if it's not in flower. 
but these Chlorodalis just love this sort of loose conditions. And this is all, like I said before, roadside botany. It's just get out the jeeps, walk up the side, and you're coming into these amazing plants. Crebenstodiums, lots of tall ones, short ones, even shorter ones. This is the Cassnei <laughs> with the Chlorodalis in the background. And again, this likes to have its feet growing in these uh, scree conditions. <laughs> it's adapted for this. Being at this high altitude, it can be sort of quite difficult for a lot of plants, but these have managed to survive for decades and a lovely little thing. You'll see this on mass all the way through. Other Corridalis, Melanochlora. Scree conditions again, growing in the slate, lots of moisture underneath, so there's lots of moisture there, extreme sunlight, extreme temperatures, and very, very compact. And we do get different uh, forms of uh, melanochlora as well, but uh, nice to see. This is the one of the second Mechanopsis. I do like the spiny ones, the horridula type. This is Mechanopsis uh, rudis. And you can tell this apart because it has these lovely uh, red markings at the base of the spine, only growing to maybe 10 centimetres, uh, and has these multiple flowers coming up. This was growing on a, a rocky outcrop, uh, so it does grow in really, really uh, poverty, impoverished soil and uh, has this beautiful blue flower, beautiful plant. And again, just another view of the landscape. You can see why we need jeeps. Uh, the roads are just like dirt tracks, but you can get quite high up. And we're just botanizing. We're stopping the vehicle and then walking up. If you see something in flower, we'll walk up. And uh, we just do that all, all day, which will be spectacular. Now we're into some of the umbles. Umbles, to me, are usually are quite tall things and invasive, but the smaller ones are really nice. And this is Hedinii. Again, growing in the scree conditions to about maybe five or six centimetres, but a beautiful little thing. Uh, so we will see a range of different uh, plurispermums. I mentioned about the, the compact uh, Inca Villies, this is probably one of the, well, not the most young, young husband eye is quite compact, but compacta var compacta is one of the smaller ones. You can see here, just the flowers just above the leaves, growing scree conditions again. Very, very nice to see. And this tends to sort of just grow probably about four and a half to 5,000 metres. You won't find it any lower. So we need to get quite high up uh, to sort of see the species, which we will do in uh, Hongshan. A lovely little aerial phytum, quite an unusual thing, looks like a, a spider. So you don't know what you're going to see when you're sort of climbing up these things. I've seen some plants that I haven't got a clue what they are, but it's always nice trying to uh, work out what the plants are. But this is the uh, Wolitchii. But again, quite a dwarf little plant. We will see a large amount of Androsaceae. This is Androsaceae delavii. And this always grows on sort of rocky outcrops. You'll never see it or very rarely see it growing in sort of scree conditions. It likes to have a, a bit of a firmer uh, foothold and tends to colonise where there's rocky outcrops. So... Screes are really interesting to find a wide range of plants, but it's also nice to look at the the rocky outcrops as well, just to see what, what's attached themselves to uh, to the stone. But a beautiful plant, very compact, good good carpet plant, and lots in flower. I talked about plants uh, on mass, and this is uh, Allium trifurcatum intermix with uh, rhododendrons. I've not gone into rhododendrons. We will see a lot of rhododendrons, dutsias. Uh, you will see the whole shebang. I'm just concentrating on some of the specialities that we will see when we go in uh, June time. So like I say, an exhaustible list of a wide range of species. 
we're now heading up towards uh, the border of Tibet and we've got to go past the, the Yangtze Bend. It's well worth uh, a photograph because this can be seen from uh, space. Uh, in the olden days when we first went, there was nothing there. Now there's like hotels and viewing platforms and uh, this is all progress, but it doesn't spoil the view of the, the Yangtze Bend. And then the last pass we will get to in Yunnan is the, the Baimashan. This is a really interesting area, 4,350 metres. And you can see here there's uh, junipers, there's rhododendron glades, there's screes, there's all sorts of things and two different types of stone as well, granite and more of the, the limestone. <coughs> but at the very top we have these beautiful swathes of rhododendron calistrotum caleticum forming sort of just acres upon acres of uh, scrub and it's interesting to see what actually intermixes with uh, this species. And here we can see little Lilium euxanthums poking their heads through the rhodes. And then underneath that, we have Cassiope selaginoides. You're just walking over this. This goes on for mile upon mile. This is a sort of the main uh, ground cover up there is the rhododendron and the Cassiope. Primulas are not taught. Too much about primulas, but we will see a vast array of primulas. Zambalensis tends to, I talked about certain plants growing in certain areas, and Zambalensis tends to sort of colonise round about the Baimashan. It likes to be more in the open, whereas some of the other primulas like to be kept in the sort of shade or in the sort of sem semi-shade. But we also have other primulas growing with it. You can see in the foreground here we have the yellow. This is uh, Sycamensis and at the very back we can see Secundiflora. And certainly Sycamensis and uh, Secundiflora tend to colonise. You'll find large areas, you see these swathes of the sort of the yellow and the purple and then Zambalensis just sort of intermixed all the way through. It's really uh, a nice sight to see. Some of the more unusual and rare things growing slightly higher up. Here we have a uh, Spongio carpella, a bit of a mouthful, but very compact carpet forming uh, pea with three or four different species. Here we have the, like say, Pachyfoliata, which is the purple form. But if it, if it wasn't in flower, you'd probably just sort of walk over it. It looks a bit like a, a potentilla, but uh, Nice to sort of see these uh, uh, species growing high up. So this is on the the, the west side, I think it is. Uh, Sosuria medusa, just growing in this sort of limestone shale. And like I mentioned, a lot of the Chinese um, use Sosurias for uh, medicinal purposes, for Chinese medicine. So a lot of these plants in the future will end up becoming quite rare or sort of growing further and further away. So it is, can be quite difficult to find some of these species. But on this side, probably one of the highlights is this whole cliff is festooned with Paraquilegia microphylla. A uh, beautiful plant, it grows on the cliffs and there'll be some plants just growing flat on the ground, but it just colonizes this whole area. Um, Absolutely stunning plant. Um, you could spend days just photographing. There's different colour variations, different flower sizes, um, and to get the sort of the screes in the background, it's a very, very photogenic plant. And also growing a little bit higher up, Androsaceae wardii, which uh, has sort of not the round rosettes, but uh, leaves. Uh, poking up, so it's a bit like Spinulifera, but smaller style, and it uh, has these lovely uh, pink flowers. And then on the other side of the the, the mountain or the hillside, uh, the stone changes to granite, and we get a different range of plants growing here. Again, Mechanopsis seem to like growing in among some of this stuff, but this is a rhodiola crenulata. 
and it forms quite large clumps in amongst the, the boulders. But the main plant here is the, the Chinocaris hookeri, the Eritrichium of China. Only I've seen this uh, in roundabout Kanding and obviously in the Bimashan, and it only grows in one patch up here. It's uh, quite high up and uh, it's on the top of the crest, so it's getting a lot of um, air movement, um, and you can, it's quite hard to see if it's not in flower. It looks quite similar to sort of some of these uh, stones, but you can sort of get your eye in here, you'll see sort of bigger patches, and it's nice to sort of see some of the big ones, and some are maybe 30, 40 centimetres wide, uh, quite large clumps, but a good map forming. I don't think it's ever been in cultivation, or uh, I might be, someone might say they're growing it, but I've never seen it. So that's us finished uh, in Yunnan. Now we are crossing into Tibet, and I mentioned the Dungdala. You can see our cars parked at the bottom down here, and you can probably make out a little figure here. Roadside botany, but at high altitudes. So again, obviously we need to walk a little bit slower, but you don't think there's much growing in these areas, but once you start getting up here and into some of these rocky outcrops, you'll be amazed at uh, what you will find. More Corridalis calcicola. Likes to have its feet in the screes with the moisture coming underneath and tends to sort of colonise just at the base of rocky outcrops. Androsicea zambalensis, another... Uh, rosette forming androsicea and this does grow on the outcrops it hates being in scree conditions it likes to have a, a stable ground to get its uh, roots down you can see here the flowers are sort of going over it starts off white and then sort of goes this sort of pinky color another strange plant uh, the slums labakia prolifera this thrives in scree conditions. You can see it's absolutely loving it here. Uh, it's got all the nooks and crannies where it can grow. And uh, very short uh, growing uh, season up here. Obviously the snow melts. They start to grow, flower, set seed, and then it's covered in snow again. But very intense ultraviolet light and extreme temperatures. Very hot during the day and very cold at night. So again... When we're out in the hills, we just need to take lots of uh, clothing with us to you get four seasons in one day sometimes. And this plant is superb. You wouldn't think nature can make these colour combinations, but Corridalis conspersa loves to have its uh, feet in water. And this lovely red, blue and yellow combination, you'd never do that in normal life, but... Like I say, nature has this uh, great way of uh, coming up with these lovely uh, patterns. Um, beautiful plant, uh, but like you say, it likes the moisture at its feet. More Crementhodiums, Crementhodium humil humili. A bit more, a bit sort of blasted by the wind. But you can see here, just hunkered down in amongst the sort of scree conditions. A lot of the plants I'm showing are from sort of scree conditions, but we will do a lot of lower down uh, botanizing as well. Another Mechanopsis, Racimosa. Again, from the Herigula group, you can see here, very, very spiny, but it uh, doesn't have the red blotches and this lovely uh, blue flower with the sort of white anthers coming down. And extremely, if you're trying to photograph it or move stuff about, the spines really get stuck in your fingers. It is quite a, a nasty, prickly beast. And a little bit lower down, a beautiful uh, Salvia wardii with this really nice uh, blue flower uh, to about 50, 60 centimetres tall. Also on the tour, the scenery is spectacular. Here we can see the hairpins at uh, Gamala. Extremely dry, but where there's irrigation, you can see there is lots of uh, greenery. This was the new road they were putting in, so they hadn't tarmacked it, and we had seven jeeps, and the first jeep was great, but the ones behind couldn't see anything, so uh, luckily we're just in a bus this time, so we'll all get the nice view. 
And this is uh, thanks to Harry. I've not been to this place. Harry was there in 2019. And this is Guzala. This is a new area. And again, this is where we take jeeps and go higher up into the mountains, 4750. And uh, when Harry showed me these pictures, I was what to go there the day after. It is stupendous, a really great place. And Primula Russiola, I'd heard about it, never seen it. And then when Harry showed me these pictures, it was like, my goodness, this is just uh, the pearly gates again, beautiful. Quite barren, quite exposed, but growing in these sort of uh, outcrops, a little bit of grass, snow is still there, so it's just prime time, but beautiful plant. Also growing with Primula dradifolia, subspecies congestifolia. So a more compact Primula, tight to the ground, but growing in these rocky outcrops. But the combination of the both is really quite nice and quite unusual. And I think one of my favourite Saussurias, uh, Aster, it's like a wee alien with these lovely sort of um, hairs to sort of protect it from the extreme conditions and these lovely uh, flowers poking out from the top. Um, stunning plant, beautiful. Um, so hopefully we'll see quite a large clumps of these. And then we mentioned the Galangla in the autumn time. You can see we've got all the sort of jeeps here, so there's a new road that comes through, but we will hopefully go through different vegetation zones. In way back in 2009, we did come across quite a lot, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, landslips and such like, so hence having jeeps, it makes it a bit easier and you can sort of detour around, but it's a bit easier this time. But this place is, is pure, pure magic. Going up through different vegetation zones, Rhododendron, Mecongensis, uh, quite a compact little um, Rhododendron, and then Rhododendron Lepidotum. And then you just keep going around different corners, getting to sort of different species. So every corner you go around, there's something new, which is really uh, unique to China and Tibet. Streptopus simplex, beautiful little thing. It's like little angels dancing on the end of leaves. Can grow quite tall, up to maybe 60 to a metre tall, and then just drops down and has these lovely, like you see, white flowers dangling down. More herbaceous stuff, rhododendron, Escufolia var, Henriquii. And it doesn't look really that uh, large. The next picture shows you how large the leaves are. It's amazing what you see in the forest. And uh, here we have Harry showing the size of the leaf. And then the glacier, like you see, is coming down. And last time we sort of drove up to the top. And at the very top, we have these carpets of rhododendron, Shami Thompsonai, Var Shami Thompsonai. Hundreds upon hundreds in full flower. Um, you see the snow is just starting to, or has melted. Um, prime time. It was quite wet here, so a lot of the pictures were taken in uh, damp conditions. But when you see plants like this, the weather conditions don't matter. And you can see in the top of the corner, this is the where the tunnel is. So we sort of now have to sort of come and walk up this uh, road up here. But the next corner, we came across this amazing caltha. I do love my calthas. Caltha sign of grassless forma rubra flora. And it's not just one, it's hillsides. Um, I can't emphasize this place. Everything is on mass, it's on steroids. Beautiful little thing, uh, very compact, and this lovely uh, purple flower. When we're out in the field, we're always trying to find different ones and white ones, and we were fortunate enough to find a white one just in amongst this patch of hundreds of uh, purple ones. So it's always a, a, a race to sort of try and find something different. Again, Primula dradifolia, subspecies congestifolia, growing, like I said, in other positions on rocky outcrops so it can sort of cascade down and get the, the moisture from the, the stones. 
And then more Primula, Primula Agliena. The scent from this was so sweet and sickly. And I've mentioned about plants on mass. We're just looking at hillsides. So it was like rhododendrons at the top, coming down to Calthas, coming down to Primulas, but tens of thousands. It was, yeah, I can't, it's, you have to be here. It, it was just spectacular. Omphalogrammas, another uh, really nice uh, species. Different. There's probably maybe 10 or 12 different species. This is Tibeticum, a bit more taller, uh, but lovely to see. And another Primula tanneri, Sarensis var protecta, growing with the Primula aglianas. So you'll see quite a lot of different uh, Primula species here. And then you're walking along and then you come across a carpet of Diapensia himalayaca. If it's not in flower, you, you walk over it. Um, but in flower, it is spectacular with these lovely waxy flowers tight to the ground. Lilies, we'll see maybe three or four in this area. This is Lilium nanum, uh, a nice little uh, pink form. Aracemas, we will see lots of aracemas. I just put Wilsonium because it's quite nice, but Ringessens, we will see quite a lot of hopefully. But Wilson Eye is the, the nice Cobra uh, Arasima, which is, is quite tall. This is up to about maybe a metre tall. So very interesting to see. And this lovely little Lilium Salcatum. Uh, you can see here it's got the little nodules at the, the base of the the, pet, uh, the petals. Uh, sing, single flower. Um, and this was maybe four or five different plants in this area. I did mention about the roads. Uh, this was in 2009. Things are different now, so we will have uh, better roads to get round. And then some of the big blue poppies. This is Mechanopsis bailei. Uh, there's two, two different forms we have here. This was the more big-leaved one just growing. There was about two or three plants just growing at the side of the road. And then Circumla, 4006. There's... One more pass after this before we get to Lhasa. Riam Nobile is the one that most people want to see. We were driving along and we saw this flower spike poking up. So we stopped and traped for about an hour and photographed it. And we thought that was it. It was lo lovely to see. And then we came around the corner and let the Chinese use Riam's for... Um, it's a food source uh, for eating, so they collect it and they also use it for medicinal purposes. And Harry's just there to show the height of this ream. It was absolutely huge. Harry's not a, a small person. And then growing next to it was Primula macrophylla var nugidia. Sorry, I'm going here. Um, quite an unusual with the, this uh, pinky flower. And then on the other side, coming down Circumla, or coming back up the next day, we came across this patch of uh, Mechanopsis bailei. Leaves are slightly smaller, but growing in more open areas. So some trees had fallen down, and this plant seemed to just establish itself in this open patch. Some orchids as well, Pyrola rotundifolia var sinensis, a lovely little plant with these nice sort of uh, flower spikes of the white and tends to sort of grow in quite shady areas. So um, you do have to sort of look around for these, some of these plants. And another plant, which I don't think is, well, it's totally underused, is uh, North Illyrian, Bulbuliferum. You can see here it's sort of this strap-like uh, plant, but the flowers itself are absolutely beautiful. They have this lovely uh, green marking to the tip and it can colonize quite large areas there was probably maybe 40 or 50 plants in this area so it's a, a nice plant and like i say a lot of it is roadside botany um here we just sort of stopped where we could and you can see some plants up on the top left and this is a primula cordoriana quite unusual to see i'd never seen this plant before i'd heard about it like i said but never seen it um, and just growing by the roadside. Another gentian, uh, Wardii emergens. 
this we saw emergence in uh, Biomachan many, many moons ago, so this was quite nice to see it somewhere else. Uh, it tends to sort of grow at quite high altitudes, uh, but just sort of coming in into flower. And then we got back up to the top and we thought we wouldn't see many Rheum nobiles, but if you look at the picture, I've shown this picture many times in lectures, but oh, sorry, all the yellow dots uh, in here are all Rheum nobile in flower. And like I say, it's being at the right place at the right time. I will probably, or we'll never ever see something like this again. I'd like to think we would, but the chances are, are quite slim. We'll maybe find maybe four or five, but to see hundreds is quite unbelievable. Some more of the, the Mechanopsis, the, the smaller ones, Impedita. Uh, this has this lovely uh, purpley stem with uh, the blue flowers and the yellow anthers. And a more sort of upright, straight one is Praniana. These like, the Praniana likes to grow in disturbed soils. And this was just by the sort of side of the road, so they come up quite uh, quite easy. A new species which was found, Androsti by Salkavar Barmaputra. Um, again, we found the yellow one on the ACE expedition, and this was a, a new find, uh, which is the more uh, pink flowered one. And then the last pass before we get to Lhasa is uh, Mila. 4,850. And again, we see the Saussuria Aster, not as nice as the one in the Guzala, but uh, quite compact, not as hairy. Some amazing Corridalis hendersonii. Um, very, very compact uh, with these lovely yellow flowers and the, it's like a, a very feathery, thick uh, leaf. And a new species described, I think, in 2012 or 13, Colladeus Millaripa. <clears throat> uh, purple flowered. Um, this is Magnus Lidain found this and uh, named it. So a new species. And Gentiana Ernia, if you look at the top of the screen, you can see the rosettes. He, oh, sorry, the rosettes. Um, are like sort of the leaves itself are spectacular. Having the flowers are like an, an extra bonus, uh, but stunning plants growing extremely high up. And hopefully, we will find plants of growing this. And the last couple of slides here, we sorry, going the wrong way. Um, we come into Lhasa. Uh, wasn't what I was I wasn't what I was expecting. It's a sprawling uh, city but we do get to go around the Patala Palace. Um, we have a half a day going around here. And this was always on my bucket list when I was a, a young boy. I always wanted to, I saw pictures and wanted to go to the Patala and this will be my third time. And just to end the, the lecture, just to say there are still some spaces available. If you are interested, please contact the, the AGS and it will be an amazing trip. So thank you very much.